what an honor it is to talk with another master of his instrument, somebody who was uh, learning under the tutelage of so many legendary cats from across the pond, uh, not just in France, but in uh, England, and uh, you know, through serendipity and through divine timing, uh, my guest wound up connecting with some of the greatest musicians that have ever walked the planet, uh, guys like Chick Corea, Wayne Shorter, incredibly inventive person, uh, has been writing for soundtracks for some time, and uh, I got hip to him because I was just digging through a record shop in Denver one day and came across this Gail Moran record with her on like several different organs and keyboards. I'm like, who's playing bass on this? And it was my next guest and such a tasteful cat. Bunny Brunel, welcome to the Jake Feinberg show. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd love to be with you. I have to ask you a couple questions right off the bat. I did an interview with a cat maybe seven or eight years ago, and I, I have to believe you guys cross paths at the very least is Francois Rabaf. Okay, that, that's an, an old name for you. Uh, anyway, I know, no, because, dude, I did this interview with this man because David Grisman, who's a great mandolin bluegrass player, had this album by... Uh, Francois called Baseball and I noticed that you did Baseball too but I was like I know Bunny might have I mean Francois Rabath what does that name mean to you? Uh, what the, the baseball mean? What does it mean? No, Francois Rabath was he on your radar when you were coming up? Uh, I, I do not know I, I you know my you know I'm 74 years old so my memory is uh, just down the drain so uh, I have to uh, write everything down because I don't remember. I understand. So I kind of remember the name, but I don't remember anything about it. Well, okay, so tell me a little bit about uh, before early on, like in your teenage years, can you talk about some of the early gigs that you played in Nice? Oh, yes. I would, I would love to do that because people don't understand. Right. <clears throat> You know, I moved to Los Angeles in 1978 to play with Chick Corea. That's when I moved. He hired me. It was just after the Stanley Clark thing. Stanley Clark left his band. He needed a, a, a bass player. Then he heard me in London. I was playing with uh, uh, Tanya Maria, a very famous uh, pianist. Singer. Absolutely, yeah. And I was playing over there, and uh, uh, Patrick Moraz, you know. The yeah, but I, dude, I, I, I couldn't. He connected you too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Patrick Moraz uh, was there every night. Wow. And uh, 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 I, I didn't know who the hell he was. You know, <laughs> so you have somebody was no, no, no. You know. I dig, I dig, I dig. Yeah. <clears throat> So he was there, and I was so nice. I was always talking to him and all that. And, <clears throat> and uh, on a Friday, he said, I'm sorry, uh, tomorrow I'm not going to be able to be here because I'm going to go see Chick Corea. I told him, well, I wish I was going with you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on Saturday, we stopped playing and all that, and suddenly he came up with Chick Corea. Oh, my gosh. And that's how I met Chick Corea. He heard me play. And he figured, uh oh, that's the, what I need to after Stanley Clark. I'm going to need that that guy. And uh, uh, that's how I get the gig with Chikoria in uh, 78. Uh, you know, he got me here. He paid for everything hotel, you know, everything to record a secret agent. And uh, I did another album with him. And uh, that's how I stayed here. And. Uh, had a career in America thanks to uh, Ch Chick Corea. After that, uh, just after that, uh, he, he, he stopped doing a duet with uh, uh, Herbie Hancock. Mm, that's right. So I, so I went on tour with Tony Williams. I was with Tony Williams. Get out of here. You were with Tony with Lifetime. Oh, yeah. I was with Tony Williams. He wanted to do an album with me and do a, a thing like that, but he understood when uh, Chick Corea came back of his tour, I had to go back with Chick. He, he totally understood that. But he still wanted to do a, a, a Tony Williams, Bonnie Brunel band. 
Unfortunately, uh, the man passed away, you know, and uh, this is my, the best year of my life, playing all over the world with Tony Williams, you know, the best drummer ever. Ever. Jazz drummer, you know, we're talking about the ever, best. Ever, ever. Philly Joe is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. This yeah, I know, I dig. Good. I know, a different deal. No, but, but Bunny, I want to yeah. go, go back. You're born in 1950. Can you talk yeah. to the audience in the late '60s? The kinds of gigs were you playing? Folk okay. mu- in Nice? Were you playing folk music? What were you playing? Uh, oh, yeah, no, 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 no. I always been a, a bass player, hmm. you know, session bass player. Oh, I actually had, had to move to Paris because that's where the recording session was all about. Absolutely. And uh, you know, I moved in Paris, you know. And uh, uh, I used to go in the morning, get the bass, uh, get you know, and go for sessions. And uh, uh, what people don't understand, especially at the time in France, those arrangers wrote everything down: the drums, the guitar, the bass line. And so I used to go sign the paper to get paid, and sit down, you know, with a, a drummer. And usually they had a, a guitar player just to play chords, just that we can play the tunes. And then we will record the drums and the and the bass. And the, I would just read the chart. That's what I was doing. And then, you know, sign the paper and go home and wait for the check to come home. So I did that for a very, very long time. And then suddenly I got hired by one of the most famous French singer that you probably don't know. His name is Georges Moustaki. Oh, yeah, no, I know him. And, so uh, many, so famous. Uh, anyway, and uh, uh, I end up being the, the music director, playing for him for a very long time, to wow. bring him around the world. And uh, uh, it, it's interesting for people that are listening that I actually played in places that nobody else plays. For instance, we were hired by the French, you know, government, whatever. I played to the all west coast of Africa. Oh my, all dude, the, you are French blessed. Colony. Ghana, like Lagos, no, Lago, yeah, Lagos. Lagos. plays there. Holy, I, I cannot all, believe know, Equator, uh, Equator uh, going north. Ah. To, you know, uh, uh, Algeria, Morocco, you know, I, I played all, all those places with him, you know, at uh, uh, and it was fantastic, you know. And then we played uh, uh, in places that the people don't, you know. I played, as I told you, with uh, Chick Corea, Harvey Hancock, Tony Williams, all those guys. Oh. I played in Japan in a couple of towns. With this guy, I know Japan North and South <laughs> Island, I know it all. I played in about 55 cities with him over there. Okay, I want to ask you, I want to stop you. And explain what, what? explain to the audience why, why the French government wanted, or just in general, why was he promoted as the face of music of France all over the world? Because I don't, well, I, I know, see his records. I see his records all the time, but I, of course, I don't speak French, so I'm really not that yeah. hip to what he's talking about. Uh-huh. Well, you know, uh, I don't know exactly. I understand that they decide to do something in in Africa. Yeah, you know, the old colonies and all that. But uh, uh, I don't know what happened with the Japan thing that uh, we played all over Japan, and it was funny because you pick up the phone. And nobody spoke anything but j- Japanese. <laughs> so I actually had to learn Japanese to be able to talk to those people on the phone. Oh. Moshi, moshi, so, oh, oh, then what about go? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. right. You know, yeah. I had to learn Japanese. You know, so uh, thanks to this guy. And uh, this is my best friend. And I used to live in Paris with him. He, asked, he had a, a house on top of a building in the uh, uh, the main island in Paris, you know. Huh. That's, uh, this is the, the best place in Paris. Uh, that, what's the name of the island? Uh, uh, you, you know, you, you have only two islands in Paris. Right. The, middle, the, right. the main one. Right. Okay? And uh, he, he had a, an apartment on top of the building and uh, just another one across. So I lived with him over there in Paris. And that's the best place in the world. People have no idea. 
If you are there in Paris, that's the place. Ile Saint Louis, that's the name of the the island. In Saint Louis. Okay. Saint Louis. Saint Louis. And, uh, you know, and anyway, that's the that's the best place ever. That's where he lived, and uh, he had that other apartment just across from his. And uh, I was there, uh, living over there. That was the best life, you know, best time in my life. And as I said, that was my best friend. He, he never, never, he knew who I was. So he never asked me to play a bass line. He knew that I would kill it. <laughs> and, uh, you know what I mean? He never yeah, said, right. Oh, no, I did. Know. Totally. Yeah. He, he just said, oh, we're going to play that thing like that. Never mentioned anything. And uh, I just... Made, made it sound good, you know. Just that's what I am. I'm a you know bass player. Well, no, this is really important. You 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 made this. You glossed over this, but I <clears throat> I remember I did a bunch of interviews with Randy Brecker, the great trumpet player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He uh, I asked him what his his most is, uh, exotic day in the studio was like. You know, going from yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, and he talked about. I think he might have done like a jingle in the morning, like a commercial. Then, yeah, yeah. He, then he goes, does an Ornette Coleman session. Then wow, okay. he goes and plays mariachi horns on a Johnny Cash session. Wow. Okay, in one day. So you, I asked, you, I asked you're Buddy. You're talking Bro about going from one side yeah. to the other, right? Yeah. Here. yeah. Exactly. So I, I, I asked Bonnie Brunel. What was your craziest day in the studio, like going from one genre to another? Or Because, yes, you can say all it was was being in the studio with the drummer, rhythm section. But, man, you have to think on your feet when you're playing in all those different settings. I just wonder what your memory is of, of a crazy day, you know? Well, you know, I, I cannot have really precise yeah. memory because what it is, it was, as I say, when you come in the studio, they put a chart in front of you. Right. And you read the freaking chart. And you just, that's what you're doing. So I read so many different bass lines that these people never mentioned me. Now they wish they had. I wish they had but, too, man. Because that early part of your career is, you know, I can't I know, find it. I, I played so many uh, recording sessions with great musicians. One of the best drummer. Andre Ceccarelli? Andre Ceccarelli? Exactly. Yes, dude. I knew so it, I man. I knew things. it, man. That's the man. You know, we people, the, you know, they know about it. No, you're talking. You you need a a, a killer. Yeah. Drummer. Yeah. Andre Ciccarelli. That guy is. Dude, all I want to see is Bunny Brunel and Andre Ciccarelli cooking the groove in 1973. That would be the, yeah. my dream, dude. So uh, you have to, but I mean, you you had the the arrangers though. They wanted it played exactly. They gave you. It wasn't chord charts. It was all like arranged. You there was no create. You couldn't put any creativity on. You had to play it exactly yeah. the, the way it was. Be, uh, you know, amazing egomaniacs. Yeah. That just writes everything, and you have to play every note they write. <laughs> and that's the problem. I'm sorry. That's the problem of French music. These people don't understand when you're in America. When they have session, they hire people to play. They give them a chart, but then let them. Make uh, no, the, yeah, you no. Know, they give them chord. They give them a chord changes, like very basic outline. Let no, them no. improvise. Yeah, yeah. It's not <laughs> that they give them them baselines, but they let them right. making it better. That's right. French people, ego maniacs, do those arrangements that sucks. Yeah, I cannot and believe. So it. you, you. I'm talking about yeah. the sixties right there. Okay? <laughs> no, no. I love this. Dude. No, but the truth is. It probably was a good paycheck for you. So, oh, yeah, you no, know, it's a gig. It's a gig. Yeah. yeah. It's a gig. So, that, so I, 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 this, is what, this is what I want to know. I, yeah. That's, that's why when I got friend, you know, with, a, uh, with that guy, you know, go live the next to his house. Yeah. You know, I, I end up stopping all that thing. No more sessions and things like that. And then when uh, I came back, the thing, I stopped doing my own gig and playing. That's why I was playing with a... <clears throat> that's how I met Ch Chikorea. Right. No. So this is this is what what I want to know is after a long day in the studio, can you talk about a couple of clubs that you and Chikorelli would go and play your music? 
not what the arranger's music was, but where you could go, people would say jam. And were you, because, I mean, I, Alex Litcherwood is a dear friend. I don't know if you know Alex or not. He's a great... Uh, Aldi, Aldi Miola? No, no, no. Alex Litcherwood. He's oh, a, yeah, Alex. Yeah, I Alex. He's a dear Alex. friend of mine. And he... Oh, yeah, yeah. I love Alex. I love him so, dude. I love him like I love you, man. And it's like those guys were playing their own brand of fusion. Were you hip? Were you? You must have seen the early weather report with Ayerto. Did you see that band? Oh uh, yes, of course. Yes. So you and then you can you talk about how you guys were adding to the vocabulary as French? I mean, you were sick of the French music, but you Ceccarelli were increasing vocabulary on that music. Yeah, definitely. You know, I I was always listening to the the jazz stuff. Yeah, and, uh, and at the time they didn't have the jazz bullshit they have bullshit. now. Bullshit. They, they they were all great players and thing, and I loved them all. And uh, uh, I fortunately was able to play with a few of them. Who who did you play and, with? <sighs> You're asking me. I told you my memories. I know. I'm thinking. I'm thinking Johnny Griffin. I'm just throwing names out there. No, uh, you know, I played with a... a Kenny Clark? One with, okay, when I came to L.A., you know, my first key was with Joe Farrell. Um, one of my heroes... Dude, next to Alex Litcherwood, Joe Farrell, I never met him. He okay. was the guy that got me into jazz. The man uh, was incredible. Were you talking about one of the greatest? Uh, ever. What happened, we, I was doing the session for Chikoria. Yeah. yeah. And Secret he agent, was, yeah. He was playing the saxophone. And then he asked me, oh, can you come and play with me Saturday? I said, oh, of course. So when the, that was my first gig in America was actually with him. <laughs> you know, that is, that, I, I that is amazing. That's my play the thing, you know, it was great. He gave me some of, you know, the chord change of the tune. He let me play and he loved it. And I loved him. And I did a few gigs with the guy. And uh, you're talking about the, the best saxophone player ever. You know, it's like, and the, but I also want to go back for a minute because I know Kenny Clark, Prez, Dolphy, all these guys relocated to Europe because they were sick of the, of the racism in the States. So I have to believe you played, did you play with a couple, a few of the, of the American masters when you were still living in France? Uh, not really. Interesting. Thing, Interesting. I told you, I I was doing all, I was on the top of the line doing the sessions. You were the first call studio with, cat. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And then I, I ended up being uh, with the Tanya Maria. And that's when things start changing. And that's when I, when I was playing in London. That's how I, I was able to meet, uh, uh, you know, Chick Corea. Right. Right. Uh, to, uh, what's his name, whatever. Uh, yeah. you no, know, no, uh, Patrick, uh, Patrick, Pat, Patrick Moran. I ended up coming here, and I'm still here. You, you... Uh, uh, let me explain to you something. That go ahead, please, understand. please. In the French music jazz, they only advertise American people, okay? Right. The fact that I'm, I'm French, they never mention me. It's just like you use, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of uh, uh, Andre Ciccarelli here and there, but they don't, and they have some fantastic players. I want to know who, but dude. You're you nailed they it, man. Advertise the yeah. American on the jazz. They have all those jazz festival, and they don't put French people. And uh, I I was lucky because uh, uh, one uh, you know in the, in the seventy nine or something like that, I met. The, the 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 head of the Antibes Jazz Festival in France. This is the number one jazz festival in the world. Antibes, yeah. And the owner, in the owner was there. He came to visit Chick Korea, and Chick told me to come. And I met the guy, and he was so happy to meet me. He put me, uh, you know, on the show. I had a show. At the uh, anti Jazz Festival. Oh my God! And in fact, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Chick was doing. Do he stayed an extra day to play with me. Oh, I love this so okay. much, man! Unfort unfortunately, the guy sold the festival. They never ever called me back. 
those suckers. And, <laughs> and I had the full house and all that. It was killer. I got to tell you, though, man, uh, you know the Meters, the band The Meters? George Porter and, uh, yeah. yeah. They, uh, Porter was, the Meters went to the Nice Jazz Festival in the early 70s, and, like, Dizzy was on the bill. Did you go back to Nice to ever play that festival? Oh, yeah, I, I played, uh, I played uh, a couple of times at the jazz, Nice Jazz Festival. And you, you, even though you were a studio shark in France, um... Were no, 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 I played because I came to America and I was famous with Chick Corea. Absolutely, that's but that, but think. that's more like '78, and I'm talking like when? When did you become a band leader in France? Did you have your own band? Uh, I did. You did. No, I did. You did not. Okay. Um, was there um, when you came? To United States, I, and I, I, I never interviewed Chick Corea, but why do you believe he knew you were the uh, the next in line after Stanley? Was it was it was it? It's not about facility. It's not about chops. This was about feel, right? That's what you know. As I told you, he came to that concert that was doing with Tanya Maria, mm-hmm. you know, in London, and. Uh, when he heard me, because, uh, you know, that's what uh, the guy told him, oh, you got to come listen to this guy. And uh, uh, when he heard me, he figured, oh, hell, that's what I need after Stanley Clock to fit. You know, you have some great bass player now, but at the time, beside the Jacko that was special, there was nobody else and then Stanley Clock. And when he heard me, he said, oh, oh that's the guy. We're talking about 1978. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, what about? I mean, uh, the guy that was he was pl- the guy that was playing six nights a week at Ronnie Scott's as the house bass player in the early 70s was Rick Laird. Now, did you were you the house player or you just were playing with Tanya Maria? I was just playing with Tanya Maria. And now, how did you actually get connected with her? Uh, I really don't remember. I know, I love you, Bunny. I, Bunny, honestly, okay, so you're, you're awesome. Listen, why then, the, the one French cat, I believe he's from France, beautiful cat, who does get mentioned in jazz is Jean-Luc Ponty. That's right. Now, I believe because some of his music could be interpreted as classical. Uh, you know, there's a classical vibe to it. Just by the instrument, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. he calls it fiddle, but that we call violin. Why is it that the French media never recognize the genius French cats and and give them? And why are they always talking about that's, these? That's that, that's the problem I'm talking. Why about do you think about. that's the case? Why do you think that is? Because they are stupid. No, but I mean that's too that's too that's too uh, that's too surface level. Let's go. But what do you mean they're stupid? They're ignorant. Yeah, the ignorance. They don't realize the difference and wow. they don't know, they cannot even appreciate it when they have a, this is the best, I'm sorry to say, yeah. for people who get upset, this is the best violin player ever. Ever. That guy killed ever, everybody. Ever, ever, ever. Okay? So you would think that French people would just put him in front and you no. Know, they are idiot ignorance. They think that oh, oh, you gotta get Americans or whatever. You know, they they are so stupid. They are totally stupid. When that's why when I came to play with Chick Corea, it was amazing. It was like they couldn't believe it. Do they do they feel because like again, this is not a good reason, but because because jazz was created in America. There's no way there could be uh-huh. Fre- there, there's no way there could be French musicians that could play jazz that well because they didn't. That, that's that's their that's their problem. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, it's ridiculous. If they, I cannot believe that's mind blowing to me. So you, this, this, unfortunately, the way they kind of put it on their newspapers and things like that, they don't understand that French musicians are quite amazing. Can you talk about recording an album with Chick? I mean, was it all first takes? I can't am seeing there being a lot of overdubbing. Yeah, it's uh, basically uh, 
first takes. First yeah. take. Can you the, the that and that's what the studio was like for you too, man. Whether it was a commercial, whether I mean, to me, you had probably what three hours to make a tune. How long did you have to yeah. make? Right. Three just hours. About it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So you could not f around. You know, you had to knock it out. Okay, you have to understand something very important yeah. with Chick Corea. Chick Corea, uh, that was like one of the amazing composer and Ever. player. Yes. And, you know, when he played with people, he actually used people abilities and let them come out with the thing that was themselves. That's right. So there was no thing like you have, you know, like the French people, oh, you got to play this, that, you know, no, no, no. He let people create stuff on top of his music. And that's what it was actually easy. You just come up and play your stuff. Okay. Right. I mean, there were probably a lot of changes. It's complex instrumental music, but he let you have yeah, your... So, so you, of, of course, you have to know to be able to do that. Of course. But uh, uh, he's not, uh, you know, he let you play with it and make it even better. <clears throat> Bunny, what is, in your mind, as a somebody who does a lot of work in the studio, soundtracks, films, gets hired for this, what are the most important qualities of leadership in your mind when you're in the studio or on the bandstand? Well, it's really important that... The when some people ask you for something, you are able to do it. If you can do that, then you can say, oh, what do you think if I do that? Then you can propose some other things hmm. and make it better or whatever. But uh, you have to understand, if somebody is in charge, he's in charge. You've got to follow whatever they want. Very important. How did you meet uh, Clint Eastwood? Uh, what happened is just, uh, uh, yeah, I met Clint Eastwood because uh, he was coming to uh, <coughs> to listen to me in the jazz club here. He what? Uh, which, what, uh, Carmelo's or where? No, no, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not anymore. Dante's? Uh, no, uh, hold on, you saying all those names, you're stopping me. <laughs> <laughs> the Lighthouse, Hermosa Beach. <laughs> No, 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 no. no. Uh, yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. so he... Okay, so Clint was a jazz Dante's. freak. It was Dante's. It was. See, I said Dante's. I was helping your memory there. Yeah, Dante, so... Dante's, yeah. and, uh, uh, you know, he was there. Each time I played, he showed up. Oh, my God. And uh, one day, you know, he asked me, you know, oh, my, uh, my, uh, my son wants to play the bass. Uh, should I send him to the school, whatever? I say, uh-uh. Give it to me. Yeah, right. Oh, I love it, dude. Oh, my God. Dude. He said, no, give him to me. Wait, you taught Clint's son bass? Yes. Oh, my God. And, uh, and uh, he's touring all around the world now. He's a killer, you know. I really did a killer job. What? And uh, he's doing uh, great ideas, playing his uh, father's uh, movies, arrangement, and things like that. And it's fantastic. He's a, he's a great bass player, and he's a very nice. And it's funny. I was just looking of a, a picture of a Clint Eastwood, sixteen years old, and he looks like hundred percent like Kyle. Really? Yeah. If you check, you'll see. I was going to say Kyle Eastwood, man. I mean, he is flying around now. I mean, <laughs> he was. <coughs> At that time, in the late 70s, early 80s, you didn't need to go to school, get a degree, in order to be a, a, music, a jazz music. I mean, it, it, it was so bizarre. It's so bizarre now that everyone, it's like this assembly line. You go here, then you must go to Berkeley or go to music school. And, and then what? Because there's no gigs. You know, and it's like before at... at at Berkeley was known as Schillinger house. Charlie Mariano would, yeah. would get off the road and he'd be strung out and he'd sober up and he'd learn an instrument at Berkeley and then he'd go back on the road. There was so much work. Now there's no work. What is That's the problem? Yes. Yeah, so, so explain to me 
what is what makes you hopeful about live instrumental improvisational music like the stuff that you played for decades with Chick and with all these amazing cats? I mean, it's I change, you know. Uh, that's what who I am. I just do what I do, and that's what it is. If it doesn't work anymore, and I have to die, I'll just have to die. Forget it. <laughs> How do you feel like, what, what is something, can you just talk about a time in your life when you faced some adversity and ultimately how you overcame it and how it made you stronger? And you just have to, what it is, you have to believe in yourself and keep going to what you do. Because that's what you're supposed to be doing. You know what I mean? That's what it is. There's, you have no choice and you pray, you know, to be able to do what you want to do and you keep going at it because that's what you do. You're not going to do something else. You know, I, uh, I'm a musician. I was very successful. And uh, uh, it's with the uh, internet and all that is different nowadays, but that's what I do. So I keep doing it. But you, yeah, no, with... with like the uh <clears throat> what did you have a struggle in your life about like taking choosing the path the purpose in your life that that maybe you people wanted you to take a more secure path your parents bunny no 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 i always just did what i wanted you wanted to so so have you had had to overcome any adversity in your life aside from the arrangers telling you play this music in the studios no, no, I just uh, just keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing, you know. So right. if I need to, nowadays, I need to get a, a, a gig uh, delivering stuff, uh, I just do it. Right. To make the extra money. You want to play something before we uh, wrap up? I mean, I, Bunny, next time I'm out in California, I'd love to grab a cup of, okay. coffee, cup of coffee with I you. I can play you something. If you, I can play you something. Yeah, please. Can you hear me? Turn up a little if you can. A little bit. What? Louder? Yeah, a little bit louder, yeah. That's good. Thank you for thank you for blessing me today, man. That was a blessing. That was so beautiful, man. Thank you so much, Bunny. I, I'm glad you like it. Hey, man. No, it just that made me. You know, the only therapy that for me now is rhythm. So to hear you plunking those bass notes, so good, man. All right. Excellent. I'm glad you loved it. Next time I'm out in her most next time I'm out in, in Cali, if I I'd love to get some coffee with you. We could do another interview. Uh, you got it. Anytime uh, you want. All right. Much love to you, man. It's so good to hear you and uh thank you for your contributions to this American music and I hope someday the French media will recognize all the geniuses. Ciccarelli, Brunel, Jean Luc. Francois Rabath. Go look up Francois oh, yes. Rabath. All the great players. 
and many more. So you take care, my friend. I will be in touch. Okay. Have a nice evening. Cheers, my friend. Bye.